den her mute. Okay. And Smoked. Good afternoon. All right, everyone, come in. Please be seated. If there's any more left in the foyer, please come in. Take a seat. I'm happy to see so many faces here at CBUS to hear about markets, Milton Friedman, and uh, what we can do to eradicate global poverty going forward. Uh, I have a few practical uh, announcements, and then we'll be uh, uh, saying hello to welcome to our two speakers. So, practically, uh, please turn off your cell phones. If you need a restroom, you will find one at the end of the hall or right at the door where you entered Cyprus. Uh, we are recording this event for the internet because we have uh, people interested in following what will happen here all across the country and not everyone could make it today. So you should be mindful of the fact that if you ask a question later on, you will be recorded uh, and broadcast to the internet. Yes, so uh, those are the practical arrangements and then I'll introduce our two speakers before giving the word to the first of them. Our first speaker is Leo Melamed. He is globally recognized as the founder of Financial Futures. As the chairman of the Chicago Merchantile, Mercantile Exchange, he revolutionized markets with the creation of the international monetary market, which was the first futures market for financial instruments. The market started out as a humble pork trading market, if I am correct, and today it has grown <laughs> to encompass a not trivial amount of dollars, which Leo Melamed will tell more about himself. Uh, 
Lambert was furthermore a personal friend and intellectual fellow traveler of Milton Friedman in the fight for economic and social liberty worldwide. Lambert will touch upon some of these themes in his talk. Our second speaker tonight is Lars Christensen, whom some of you may also know. He is uh, the chief analyst and head of emerging markets at Danske Bank. Christensen is the author of the book Milton Friedman, A Pragmatic Revolutionary, which is published in Danish. Christensen has contributed to numerous other books as well. Christensen's personal blog is The Market Monetarist, which is perhaps the capacity in which Christensen is the most famous internationally, because even my American libertarian friends keep linking to it. Uh, and finally, Christensen is a senior fellow at the British Adam Smith Institute. So those are our two speakers. And with that, I will welcome the first of our speakers, Leo Melamed. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for joining me on this uh, moment of uh, uh, travel that I'm on. Actually, I just came from Poland where uh, I was attending the opening of the Polish Jewish uh, Museum, historical museum, which was uh, just unveiled uh, two days ago, and quite a feat. Um, I was happy to be there, but as a result of my going to visit there, um, I was also asked if I could visit a couple other countries and uh, offer some thoughts and some conversation. And so I, I did write something down, which you're not going to get, but you are going to hear the title. I called it Milton, Myron, Merton, Markets, and Me. I like alliteration, so. Uh, but the gentleman I named, of course, should be some people that you know the last name of. Milton Friedman, of course, Myron Scholes, of course, Merton Miller, of course, are the three Nobel laureates that affected my life considerably. Uh, markets, well, I have something to do with that, and that's me. Um, I am not an economist, so uh, if you're looking for that, you can now leave the room. I am a lawyer by profession, uh, but I gave up practice of law a long time ago when I was about your age, and uh, went to the markets um, as a trader. I began as a trader. Um, my father was very, very upset at me because I gave up a profession that is considered uh, quite important and with good standing usually um, and for being a trader, which in his mind, he was old school and uh, that was a gambler, you know. So I gave up an upstanding profession of honesty to become a gambler in the markets. Um, he eventually realized that I had other things in mind. Let me begin with those other things by shocking you. Um, according to the BIS, that's the Bank of International Settlements, a most respected institution in the world, the notional dollar value of financial futures traded in 2000 13. Now I want you to hear the number. Was an outstanding one quadrillion eight hundred and eighty-six trillion two hundred and eighty-three billion and four million dollars. Now if anyone in this room understands that number, raise your hand because I don't. And few uh, people would. It is an unbelievable large number of dollar values that were traded in financial futures in the world, mostly at the CME Group, which is the exchange that I came to. And so we launched, as you heard, under my direction, something called the International Monetary Market. And um, <coughs> The fact that 
we traded this kind of number in financial futures, which is next door to financial and financial derivatives in 2008 were partially, in some quarters, blamed for the meltdown in the world of finance. And that is partially true. So this number of, what did I say, one quadrillion and on and on and on, is an incredible number in view of the fact that in 2008, these financial futures and the over-the-counter derivatives, which they also were part of, grew to this outstanding number after the crash, in spite of the fact that they somehow had something to do with the crash. You would think something like that would not happen, that people would shy from it, people would leave, people would do other things. They couldn't because financial futures represent one of the most efficient instruments of finance with which to manage risk. You can't get away from it. It can be done cheaper, more effectively, and more with better results than in any other way of managing risk. The financial futures we launched was not that long ago. Most of you, it was in your lifetime because it happened in 1970. Now, I got my first lesson in economics in 1939. In 1939, I was seven years old, and I was in Vilnius. Vilnius is the Lithuanian capital today of um, that country. And I was there not for a tour with my parents. We had been captured in Bialystok by the Nazis in 1939, September 1st. I was seven. And our fate could have been what happened to six million Jews in Poland and the rest of the world, but it didn't because my father was probably one of the most brilliant people I have ever met who knew or something, something told him to pick up his wife and only child and run. We ran in a Hollywood-type story that people have difficulty believing um, that we did it. It took years. We, uh, we crossed all of Siberia, ended up in Vladivostok, which is a seaport on the far end of Russia, crossed the Japanese Ocean to Japan, and from Japan, ended up in the United States only five months before the United States went to war with Japan, or vice versa. Now, you can imagine my parents had all kinds of decisions to make in, in that two years and some months of, of, of hiding, both from the um, Gestapo, as it were, as well as the NKVD, which was the, the Russian precursor to what you know as the, the KGB today. But yet, all those decisions that he and my mother had to make to save our lives were not as important to them as one fact. The fact was I was seven years old and I was about to enter first grade and couldn't do it. Where would my education come from? They were worried. They were both teachers in Poland. So they decided that they would be my teachers wherever and however possible. And we were in Wilno, which was Vilnius today, 
When my father said to me, holding up a coin, I brought one, holding up a coin, he said, do you know what this is? And he handed it to me. And I looked at it and I said, remember, I'm seven years old. I said, oh yeah, it says Lotte. Well, that's the unit of currency in Poland, of course. And he said, yes, that's right. And then he took another coin out of his pocket and handed it to me. And what is this, he said. I looked at it, and I had already exhausted my economic knowledge <laughs> and said, I didn't know. He said, that's a litas, which is the currency here in Lithuania. What are they worth? I, I, I said, the same? He said, well, that's interesting, because that's what the government says. Let's go find out took me by hand to a bakery, not far. Lithuania was still kind of normal at that point. And he asked the baker how much was a loaf of bread. And the baker said, um, one litas. So my father said, good, we'll take it. And as the baker was wrapping it up, my father handed him a zloty. And the baker looked and said, no, no, no. Two zlotis, one litas, two zlotis. Really? So my father paid, and as we walked out, he said, see this? Only the marketplace can tell you real value. <laughs> Never mind what the government said. It took two zlotis to buy the same loaf of bread that one litas would do. So there's something going on here, and only the public marketplace can make an honest determination of value. Imagine that. This is 1939. He never heard of Milton Friedman. But that lesson was monumental in my life. And I never forgot it. I'm trying to check to see where I'm going. Now, the world, of course, at that moment in time, for those of you who may not fully know, was going to be on fire. And um, it probably was never going to be the same. Uh, it affected 100 million people in the world. Uh, it, it affected 30 different countries. And uh, we're still feeling the effects of that World War II. And we, that is, these three folks, my mother, father, and I, traveled through the uh, continents, three continents, seven languages. My parents never stopped putting me in school because they never knew how long we'd be where we were going. So if it was three days, I was in school. If it was six months, I was in school. I began to learn, Lith well, I knew Yiddish and Polish. And then I began to learn Lithuanian, then Russian, then Japanese, believe it or not. I learned none of it, you know. <laughs> but they tried. And we, of course, ended up in Chicago because they got jobs there. So over these years, and thereafter, as I grew up in Chicago, I learned something from a guy called Milton Friedman and found to my astounding <coughs> um, discovery that he, too, said the same thing my father said that time in Wilno. And I began to read his works, all of them. Capitalist and Capitalism and Freedom a 1962 publication by Milton Friedman is probably the greatest book on economics ever, ever written. You don't have to read anything else if you read that. I read that. And although I ended up as a lawyer, I used to run to listen to Milton Friedman's lectures at the University of Chicago lectured where he was a teacher. I couldn't afford to go 
to UFC. Uh, that was expensive. I was still, I drove a taxi to, to pay for my tuition at John Marshall Law School, so I certainly couldn't have paid the tuition at the University of Chicago. I'm sorry. It was very expensive. But, I, but you, could, you could sneak into lectures. They didn't take attendance. So when I became chairman of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in 1969, I had become a street economist by virtue of these lectures and, and the things I read. And the thing that, that bothered me was that that lesson meant that the fixed rate of the, the fixed exchange system where some ministers get together once a year and decide what the values are relative to each other. It started as the Bretton Woods system called, what it was called, it was a fixed exchange reality. And every year, 1945 is when it began, that's the end of the World War II, and every year the ministers would get together and say, so this changed and that changed, therefore, uh, this is worth so much to the dollar, the Deutschmark is worth this, the lira is worth that, the krona is worth that, always relating it to the dollar, and with good reason. After the war, there was only really one country left with any consequential economic standing, and that was the United States. So everything was measured against the dollar. But by the time I became chairman in 1969, the world had changed completely. All these countries had overcome the war. They were now economic powerhouses of their own. And values kept changing all the time because information was flowing. It used to be, when I was growing up, if a, a minister in, in Japan would say something of importance that affects the yen value to the dollar, we wouldn't know it for the first week or two because it would take time to travel, to understand, and to be influenced by what he said. But now, by the, the information was flowing at a speed of light. And you knew the minute he said it that this would affect the value of the yen against the dollar. And yet, that wasn't what the government said, because they hadn't met yet to take that into consideration. And I knew that that system was not real. It couldn't work because the public would know that that change had occurred and they wouldn't listen to the values pre prescribed by the ministers a year before. So there'd be a constant series of devaluations, revaluations, and on and on and on. And I thought to myself, you know, the way to solve this is if you had a, a market in foreign exchange that would react moment to moment as information came forward from wherever it came. I thought it was a good idea. I went to my board of directors. Now, I want you to understand, I was in my 30s, and they were under their 130s. <laughs> So when I came forward with this, they knew that I was a wild young kid. There was a mistake to have me as chairman, that I would clearly bring down the reputation of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with this nonsensical idea. They were trading in pork bellies. Their history was butter and eggs. Future markets, they explained to me, only dealt in agriculture. What I was saying is pure heresy and stupid because it never would work and it would just endanger the reputation. of. The, I want you to know about the Chicago Mercantile Exchange reputation. It was known as the most corrupt institution in America <laughs> because they allowed every kind of corruption to occur. Squeezes, corners, monopolies, whatever went on as long as the board of directors could participate in some fashion, it was okay. In fact, the United States Congress, I think it was in 1958, had to pass a law 
that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange must never again trade in onions. It's still on the books. <laughs> because, because they had allowed a squeeze, a squeeze, which is a corner in onions, such that was untenable. The farmers of the United States that grew onions marched en masse, some million of them, to Washington, D.C., and demand that they kill this market in Chicago by these crazy people. That reputation I was endangering with this idea. <laughs> so I needed, I, 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 you know, again, I was a lawyer. I needed some economic credibility. Well, I thought there's this guy down the street who oh, I've never really officially met, but his name was Milton Friedman, and I've I, I got to go to him. Now, I'm scared. I'm scared because, again, you know, you have this idea, but you have no credentials. I called him up, and I made an appointment. We met, actually, he was on his way for a vacation. It was July, and he was going. He, he had a house in Vermont, which is up east, and, and he would meet me at the Waldorf Astoria a Hotel, very famous hotel in New York, for lunch. And I came, and he came. And the first thing I said to him, promise me, oh, he knew who I, who I was, after all. I was chairman of this little institution. Down the street, there was the big institution called the Chicago Board of Trade. They were a much older, much bigger futures exchange dealing in grains with a very strong reputation. But nevertheless, I was chairman of something, and <laughs> I said to him, please don't laugh at what I'm going to suggest. And he said, I promise I won't laugh. And so I said to him, I'm thinking of launching foreign currency as a futures market. Oh my God, he said, what a great idea. You must do it. I was stunned. I said, wait, would you repeat that? He says, it's a terrific idea. Uh, Bretton Woods is going to come under, and when it comes apart, uh, this will be the way that currency will be evaluated in the world. You will certainly succeed. I said, wait, wait, no one's going to believe me. Absolutely nobody is going to believe me you said that. Just tell him he said. It's a great idea. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't know what I'm dealing with back in Chicago. You must put this in writing, I said. I was a courageous little kid. He said, oh, you want a feasibility study of why foreign exchange would make a good futures market? I said, exactly. I wasn't quite sure what feasibility study meant, but <laughs> I gathered it would be okay. He said to me, well, you understand I'm a capitalist. Uh, I said, I understand that how much? We settled on $7,500. And he wrote the feasibility study, which you said you just recently read again, 1971. That $7,500 is worth today what the Chicago Mercantile Exchange arguably is worth this moment, something on the order of $22, $23 billion. Now, that's a good trade. <laughs> I took that paper he wrote and went everywhere with it. Don't believe me. I'm a stupid lawyer. But look, here is what Milton Friedman says about this idea. The Business Week, uh, The Economist, The Time Magazine, every publication on earth said that this would not work. This is audacity of some guys that are pork belly traders, gamblers, to think that they could tread on the financial world and, and take advantage of people who are expert in this world and trade that currency. None of them thought it would work. Nobody, absolutely nobody. Nevertheless, market on May 16, 1972. Seven currencies, all the majors. And it worked. I mean, work means 
there was a bid, there was an offer, and constantly changing. Bids and offers, seven currencies. And 30 years after their launch, a economist, Nobel laureate, Merton Miller, made this astounding statement. I don't know if I can find my place to read it to you. <coughs> he said that the launch of financial futures at the CME in 1972 was the greatest innovation in economics of the past 25 years. And he also said that in his view, it was the beginning of what modern finance would be from here forward. Well, that was quite a statement. But I was very lucky. So you have to attribute a lot of it to luck. Because at that moment, Things happened in the world that if I had written the script for the background of a, a launch in foreign currency or a launch in any financial instrument, I could not have done better than what was going on in the world. Listen, you remember the oil that happened then? It sent the dollar down to almost an unheard of amount. Un the United States was in excess of 10%. The embargo skyrocketed prices of crude oil to an unprecedented high of $39 a barrel then. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, you know where it is, fell to 570, 570. Gold reached then $800 an ounce. U.S. inflation climbed to an unprecedented 20%, 20% inflation. And interest rates went even higher. So how about that for being lucky? Because clearly the events of that moment in the world demanded a place to transfer risk or to assume risk if that was your preference. You couldn't do better than this kind of background. So yes, I was lucky. And I also benefited with one other thing. In 1973, about a year and a half after the launch of our financial market, a guy named Myron Scholes, together with um, Mr. Black and Mr. Merton, um, wrote a paper showing the world how you can measure options risk. and was born the CBOE, the Chicago Board Options Exchange, for listing listed options for trade. Another, another market to measure risk and transfer risk. And that was fortunate also, because it came almost at the same time. At the same time, of course, the world communications was changing. You remember that in the late 1980s, computers came to the fore. And with them came the ability to understand what was happening everywhere almost in an instant fashion. I thought at that time in about 1986-87, that the manner in which we were trading this very successful market now was trading currency and interest rates and equity futures, stock index markets and the like, that this, this very market was still using a system called open outcry. You've seen the pictures in a pit or a ring where people stand very interesting colored jackets and shout their bids and their offers and, and, and are accepted by someone uh, across the way. And that is how open outcry works. 
And that was the system of exchanges since the time they began in, in the Middle Ages when uh, people would bid an offer for cargoes coming in from some other foreign land and they would bid an offer for that cargo before the ship arrived even. Well, with communications being what they were, I thought that we could do better than open outcry. I thought you could create an electronic system that replaces the need for a runner to begin um, life by taking an order from a desk, running it into the pit to the broker, and then later picking up the executed order, running it back to the desk for communicating to where it came from. This is what I was doing when I first came to the exchange. I was a runner. And I thought, my God, today's world, you ought to be able to do that um, in automated fashion and how much more efficient that would be. Yes, good idea, but again, I was going to fight status quo. And Milton Friedman coined a phrase called the tyranny of status quo. The tyranny of status quo is exactly what I had to face once again because the status quo meant the brokers had uh, something to do. That was their profession. They executed the trade. If a machine was going to do that for them, they were out of a job. And a battle began in the late 1980s that lasted for the next 20 years. Eventually, of course, everyone does electronic trade. There isn't a market today that doesn't do it electronically. We, our market is called Globex, and it was launched in 1992. And it took a very long time for it to be accepted and work. But eventually it did. And today, well, let me back up. Before Globex took hold, the CME, the Merck, was able to do just barely over a million contracts a year. Our average today is 13 million a day. That's what Globex was able to do. In fact, about two weeks ago, during the day when the, the U.S. stock market fell some $300, we traded 40 million contracts on Globex, where our average is 13 million. And the reason for that is during any upheaval anywhere in the world, anything that happens can be affected by that market. And the exchange offers you an opportunity to manage that risk or take on that risk. Because computers could disaggregate and could repackage in things called derivatives, slicing and dicing the various components of risk and putting them in an over-the-counter fashion. We couldn't do that so well in, in, in the futures exchange because we, we dealt in the boxcar uh, things, we, the, the benchmark currencies, interest rates, and so forth. But, but the computer could slice and dice that. Actually, that same effect was happening throughout the 20th century. We went from the big to the little in everything. When, when the century began, Albert Einstein told us about the universe. Well, by the 1950s, we were already talking about subatomic particles. So we, so we went from the big to the little. In biology, you know, the, the, the century began with the understandings of cells, that we are composed of cells. By the 1960s, we were doing gene engineering. We could move the, the, the genes that are made up within the cell and move them around to a point that you could do something better with it and cure some disease that uh, otherwise not be cured. So the entire world in the 20th century actually did the same thing, went from the big to the little, and that's what happened in finance. Derivatives are the little, and financial futures 
are the little but in a bigger, bigger benchmark fashion. That revolution, by the way, the communications revolution, didn't stop there. It went on to become fast. So it got little and it got fast. Let me read you a statistic. In Globex, when we launched Globex, the speed by which an order could go, be executed, and come back was 2,500 milliseconds. 2,500, that's, that's fast. 2,500 milliseconds. You know what it is today? Three milliseconds. That's faster than you can blink your eye. And I don't know where we go from here. But as long as the human being <coughs> continues to thrive on innovation, we will continue to do that. There is today um, something called high-frequency trade because trading itself went through a metamorphosis. And today machines, computers, can do things that the human mind can't do as fast. And so um, high-frequency trade developed as a way to, with artificial intelligence, of course, as a way to do transactions that a human mind can't do as quickly. Sure, somebody has to program them, and that still is a human being. But nevertheless, it's the computer that can make the decision of what to do. The millions and millions of increments of profit, little increments of profit, uh, 10 million times, it's a lot of money. And these HFT, high frequency trade components, are changing and have changed the world of trade. Now, there's some people that say they do more harm than good. Maybe so. They do some harm, maybe. But you're not going to stop it because the human mind is going to keep on doing things. And it's going to use whatever, whatever it invents. HFT is part of the technological revolution which permeated every nook and cranny of our lives. All of you are witness to that. Everything is faster. We are online, online, 24-7, 365. I'm surprised some of you aren't texting as I speak. That's, I, I thank you for that. We text. We Twitter, we email, we Google, we Yahoo, we Facebook, we iPad, we iPhone, we Blackberry, we Android, and now we even Alibaba. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leo. Now it's our second speaker, Lars Christensen, head of uh, emerging markets at Danske Bank and internationally famous blogger at The Market Monetarist. The floor is yours, Lars. Thank you. Uh, my, can we find my presentation somewhere here? Excellent. Uh, I actually hate these PowerPoint things. Uh, and uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Leo, for a very inspirational presentation. Uh, I don't know whether to talk about uh, Poland uh, where you, and, 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 and Lithuania, where you start out, two countries I hold in very high regard personally. Uh, and interestingly enough, maybe we should start to talk about that because the litter slotty exchange rate is one of the things I've been thinking about quite a bit over the past 15 years because I've been covering both countries and both currencies. It's been pretty easy with the litters. It's been pegged to the euro and earlier to, to a basket of currencies. Uh, but if there's a currency I talk, st spoken, about, uh, spoken about and thought about a lot uh, more than any other currency over the past 15 years uh, working in the financial sector, it's the slotty. So, uh, you know, I have had the same kind of lesson, but in the, in, 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 in not in a, in a baker in Vilnius, uh, even though I've been in a Vilnius baker, uh, paying with litters, uh, not with slotty. Uh, I think that was very telling. Uh, of course, Milton wrote that famous p paper back in 71. Yes. I was born in 71. Um, and I didn't read the paper then. I, I read it somewhat later. Uh, 
I think it was had, had around 20 or 22 or something like that. Uh, but, but if there's anything that I do in my daily job at, at Danske Bank, I should say I'm not speaking on behalf of Danske Bank now, it is to think about currencies, try to forecast currencies. Uh, the problem with that is that when you believe in markets, you tend to think that markets are more clever on an aggregate fashion than the individual. So you know that if you're trying to forecast the, the future of, of, of uh, what would happen to the slotty, well, I could just look at what Leo created. I could just look at the slotty futures market, and the slotty futures market would give me the market's best prediction for where the slotty will be in three days, or in three months, or in three years try to outbeat that and I can tell you uh, even though I made won many forecasting competitions but it's sheer luck I will tell you you know the market uh, you can you can sometimes beat the market but on average I tend to think that you can't beat the market and that's also which is I think the inspiration that Leo gives in when we talk about it uh, Mr. Friedman uh, often spoke about being an economist is not a formal education, it's a way of thinking. Um, and in that sense, Leo, you, you, you qualify as an economist, as do the Baker in, in Vilnius, as did your dad. Uh, unfortunately, many who call themselves economists do not qualify as economists. Uh, many of them are today heading central banks around the world. Uh, and, 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 and as a consequence, I would, I would suggest that maybe we should replace central bankers with markets because markets tend to know economics than, than, than central bankers. And I will try to illustrate a point about how we could contact, learn the lesson from Leo and from Friedman and from, from my friend Robert Hetzel who spoke here uh, in, in 2013 about how we can use money to think about monetary policy or markets and money to think about monetary policy and, and events. And I really think that one graph will do it. Uh, here it is. Uh, when we think about the crisis we find ourselves in right now, and found ourselves in back in 2008, there, I think there is no graph more telling than this. This is the so-called five-year break-even inflation rate. What is that? Well, the five-year break-even inflation rate is the market's expected U.S. inflation over the coming five years at a given time. So at the moment, you will see inflation expectation in the U.S. is well below 2% for the next five years, meaning that from a U.S. monetary policy, I argue that U.S. monetary policy is actually too tight because inflation is below the Federal Reserve 2% inflation target. The market is telling you that's where we are. In fact, if you look at it over the past couple of years, the Fed have had officially a 2% inflation target only since the beginning of 2012. It has more or less averaged 2%, meaning that the market has been telling the Federal Reserve, you are more, your, 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 your target is more or less credible. We believe that that is what you will deliver over the coming five years. This is the kind of market Liu started to set up. We now have that in everything. Not in everything, but a lot of things. That is the wisdom of the market, is, is combining, aggregating wisdom. And that aggregation of m wisdom is greater than any individual wisdom. Uh, from time to time I do a presentation on this, I, 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 I try to jump on a table and have people guess how much I weigh. <laughs> uh, I did that uh, uh, not too long ago, and I, I didn't bring anything to weigh myself with but I more or less thought I knew how much I weighed. It turned out that I had everybody in the room write a number for my weight. It came out that I was rather fat. Uh, that at least was the verdict of the market. And I said, ah, close enough. It was four or five kilos above what I think. And I tried to tell the audience that, well, you got it more or less right. You know. I went home and said, this is not a good example. It didn't work. I came home to my wife and told her about it. She was not rather interested. She's a biologist, so she's you know, um, interested in saving the world. Um, so that kind of economics and markets wasn't really interesting. But what turned out when I jumped on the weight was the market was right and my own perception of my weight was wrong. 
Imagine that I had been a central banker in 2008. What would I have said about monetary policy? Well, my perception of monetary policy in 2008 was, well, monetary policy is very easy. Interest rates are very low, so uh, we are keeping very accommodative monetary policy. But what was the market telling us? Well, Milton Friedman would first of all tell us that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, also in the future. So why don't we ask the markets to tell us about the future of inflation in 2008? This is what happened to the expected inflation in the US. At the end of 2008, the market was telling us that we were going to have 2% deflation in the coming five years. That was a pretty clear signal to central banker that monetary policy has become far too tight. That sounds revolutionary, doesn't it? Most people said the monetary policy was very easy. Well, it became extremely tight. And that is why the whole thing crashed. It has nothing to do with futures and derivatives and greedy bankers. No. It had most of the fact to do that central bankers was as good as judging the monetary conditions and as I am to judge my own weight. They are biased. I tend to think I'm a good-looking guy, and probably if the market was telling me that, I, you know, that would be another judgment. <laughs> then something happened. We started to have monetary easing. The Fed was trying to develop reserves, trying to do all kinds of things, and eventually it seemed to, to think, and you can see that we are now back to a world where inflation expectations have been very fa fairly stable in the U.S. So how about the... ECB, European Monetary Policy. Well, <laughs> it didn't succeed in the same way because the Federal Reserve, although the ECB has the same perception about its own abilities as, as I have about my weight. Well, it's actually much more extreme. They do think that they're the most clever central bank in the world, but what do they deliver? Deflation. And what is the market saying? They're going to deliver that for a very long time. In fact, if you look at futures, you would see that the market is now telling you that monetary policy in Europe is more deflationary than it has been at any time in Japan over the past 15 years. That is the verdict of the market. Not of me, not of central bankers, but of the kind of markets that Leo helps set up. That is extremely important information. Unfortunately, only market participants use this. I speak to clients every day of major international corporations and institutions that only think about their risk. So they will use futures to hedge that risk, to ensure that they buy um, a car producer. I would hedge the risk that the price of metals go up. I use futures to that. I use that to that. That is an extremely important thing. And anybody who say we, we want to get rid of all these derivatives and futures, they might as well say outlaw fire insurance. It's very, very dangerous with fire insurance. It leads to fires everywhere. <laughs> well, it might be if the government is paying for your fire insurance, and I notice that tend to <laughs> thing tends to blow up, but that's another story. Futures is simply a way of insuring your risk. And anybody who's saying otherwise do not understand it. And if you notice policymakers, the things they don't understand is to think is very dangerous. Leo Stad understood on markets instinctively. Most people do when they are in, in actually. When they got money on the table, suddenly people understand things. My kids understand money and markets very well when we negotiation at home. I brought home yesterday a huge package of Lego for my son. I had bribed him to behave on a five-hour flight the day before. It worked. Problem, of course, now created a system of moral hazard. He will misbehave at any given opportunity. Uh, <laughs> Lego, dad. Um, anyway, the market is useful for telling us about the future. So how does that play into how we should conduct monetary policy? And what would Milton Friedman say about it? Well, Milton Friedman, of course, is well known for suggesting that central banks should ensure 
low and stable inflation, a stable growth in normal demand in the economy by having the money supply growing at a steady fixed rate year in and year out. Friedman suggested you just replace the Federal Reserve with a computer that basically prints the same amount of money on a yearly basis or growing at a steady pace, 3, 4, 5 percent. That thing, while theoretically correct, proved to be complicated because of Leo. Why? Because while the, the, the relationship between money growth and nominal demand in the economy and inflation was rather stable until the early 80s when the US financial markets and the global financial markets in general were liberalized and we had financial innovation, money became a less clearly defined thing. The so-called velocity of money became more unstable and therefore it became harder to, to just do that and control the money base also because a lot of the money creation was done by banking, by commercial banks. <clears throat> at that time, Robert Hetzel, then and now at the Richmond Fed, suggested, and this is from uh, Milton's great book, uh, Money Mischief. By the way, Leo, did you know that that Vermont uh, house that Rose and, and Milton had uh, was actually financed by the revenue from selling uh, capitalism freedom? <laughs> oh. um, so, so I think it was called something Cap Freedom or something like that, the house. Anyway, uh, Friedman wrote another book. I, I highly recommend anybody who is, who is, is uh, who, who, who going to university but just wants to read about monetary policy, read that book and you'll get it all. Uh, he says this about uh, Robert Hetzel. Recently, Hetzel has made an ingenious proposal that may be more feasible politically than my old earlier proposal to change, yet uh, that promise to be highly effective in restraining inflationary bias that affects governments. A market measure of expected inflation would make it possible to monitor for the Federal Reserve behavior currently uh, and <clears throat> to hold it accountable. Yes, I just did, because this is the market created on that. There is a futures market, because Friedman said to Robert Hetzel, write up op op for the Wall Street Journal this. Bob did that. And then Bob started to send letting, uh, Freeman started to send letters to Alan Greenspan and to Larry Summers, who was then Treasury Secretary in the U.S. And they started up what had become the U.S. tips market. Well, bonds, government bonds, are normally nominal. But you can also think of bonds as being linked to be inflated. That's what you do with the so-called tips. The difference between interest rates on a real and a nominal interest rate is exactly the inflation expectation. And what Hetzel suggested was, just pack it. Just say it should be 2%. We can always see whether the 2% inflation target is credible or not by looking at the market. We don't need to look at money supply. We don't need any macroeconomic data. When the Federal Reserve or the FOMC of the Federal Reserve is meeting today, they could do one thing. They could take this graph and look at it and say, the target is here, the market is telling us this, probably we shouldn't hike interest rates right now. And they go out to us in the market and say, we are aware that this has happened. Thank you very much. Goodbye. In a Hawaii shirt, preferably. <laughs> because you don't need anything else. The market could do that. The Fed could in fact go out and say, we will always buy or sell government bonds to ensure that that is exactly picked at 2%. This was what Milton Friedman then went on to suggest. So Milton Friedman actually abolished his idea of, of, of having a, a steady growth of money supply and instead endorsed the 92 Hetzel's idea based on the fact that the market should implement monetary policy because the market has all the information about the world that is visible. Over the past half year, I spent a lot of time looking at the Russian economy. Ukrainian conflict, well, most of the time over the past half year. And I get very depressed about it. But when I get really depressed about it, I look at the Dow Jones. And I can see the Dow Jones have been going steadily up all year. And I'm thinking the collective wisdom of billions of investors around the world have 
my own wisdom about what Russia and Ukraine. This is not going to lead to the Third World War. Well, in fact, investors have known this before. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, those 11 days, of the Dow Jones dropped 1%. I'm not sure why that was, but the market apparently was clever enough to see this is not going to end in a Third World War. It had dropped significantly well behaved of that, but that was on, uh, on JFK introducing some horrible labor market regulation. But that's another story. But the market is the predict best predictor. It's not a perfect predictor. But give me any person in the world that you consistently can say he has beaten the market. Well, he's just been had a winning streak. He's been a lucky guy. Warren Buffett is not a great investor. He's the world's luckiest guy. You know, you can always find something. Ask him to flip a coin ten times, and, you know, it might be ten times heads or ten times tails. But we know that if you take 2,000 people, half the time is over tails. It, 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 the market is the best source of information we have. And therefore, when we conduct monetary policy, why not use the market? Why not use the kind of markets that Leo helped create? And therefore, I think that what we should do today, and Leo, you might want to help me here, is what we need to do is set up a futures market for nominal GDP. Why? Because that is exactly what Milton Friedman was talking about, really targeting. Milton Friedman, you've seen his car, uh, Red Mustang, I think. Uh, Bob, you, have you seen it as well with the... With the with the, with the license plate uh, MVPT, yeah. which is the equation of exchange. The PT, of course, is the nominal GDP. What I'm suggesting here is that we target, we introduce a futures market for nominal GDP. Because then every action the Federal Reserve takes, Yellen comes out, she is dressed differently, the market says, hmm, that's a hawkish signal. Nominal GDP, Future tends to sell the uh, normal GDP drop below our target. Then the market will know, hmm, it's becoming more, 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 more hawkish. Then the, the Federal Reserve can read the market and say, hey, we don't intend to do that. Sorry, I put on a pink shirt. You know, tomorrow it will be red. You know, that you know, it means that normal GDP should be growing at 4% or 5% or whatever the target. That would completely abandon any discretion in monetary policy because normal GDP futures will tell you exactly how tight monetary at any minute in time 24 four hours a day all year round that will also be the Fed of course if that diverts from the target on normal everybody could say to the Fed you're failing they will be held accountable <coughs> in fact the FOMC could completely be abolished. You can just peg that price to the future. Then you have fully automatic monetary policy. You would have Milton Friedman's computer, which of course is another word for the market. Well, actually, today, those two things are very much the same thing. So what I'm saying here is that what the kind of futures markets we have, if we use that, we can have markets implement monetary policy with the knowledge of billions of investors around the world in just of the collective actions of the same kind of people that doing the Bretton Woods was like meeting once a year to adjust exchange rates in a horrible fashion. So that would be my message, that markets are a very, very useful too. Friedrich Hayek told us that, Ludwig von Mises told us that, Milton Friedman more than anybody told us that. And we should embrace the idea about using the markets. Obviously, one could say we should completely get rid of central banks. Milton Friedman favored that in the end of his life. I think all of you know what I think about it. I think everything Milton said was right, um, even when they contradicted itself. Uh, <laughs> I, I can find explanations when Friedman was wrong in 53 and right in, 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 in 98 or, or the other way around. What was very clear about Milton was that he, he became increasingly more and right, more right over time. You know, he learned towards the end of his life. Um, anyway, I think that, that, that's where I want to conclude, that that is really what, what, what is uh, my message. That we don't need policymakers. The markets 
are a much stronger tool for getting the right institutions, also in money, uh, and money stability. And, and if we have that, uh, then we get a much more sound monetary system and a much more uh, a, a institutional setup, much less prone to to the kind of crisis we got in in 2008. And just to return to that, yeah, it wasn't the futures market or the derivatives market or the banks that failed in 2008. It was the central bank, and the kinds of markets Leo set up told us that by minute by minute. Thank you. Yes, thank you to Lars. Very good presentation. So now we're at the point where both of you take the stage uh, for comments on each other's presentations, if you have any. Or if not, we'll go to brief questions for the audience. I wonder if you would, uh, if you both need a chair, or if you can both, you, you are requested to take the stage as well, you. You know, it's interesting that right here, both all the central bankers in the United, well, in the United States for sure, all said that we're doing okay and that the world looked very stable and that everything was all right. Every one of them did not see this coming. So the message that Hans gave you is a practical application here. None of them. Not Yellen, not Bernanke, n not anybody. I went and looked for it. Did anybody have that prediction? Nobody. So these are the policy makers. The market, of course, knew better. We were on the threshold of a disaster. And it happened. That's an interesting point. Do you have any comments for Leo? Or no, I think, well, I, I, then I'll just end up talking about Poland, but that, that I think that that's not the topic of today. Uh. All right, then we'll proceed with uh, questions from the audience. So uh, we have like 10 minutes at most, which is one reason I would ask you to keep your questions brief, keep your questions concise. Uh, and also, please uh, stand up and introduce yourself to the speakers by mentioning your name before proceeding to the question. All right, we have a questioner over here. Uh, Emil Gane, uh, this is mostly to Lars, and like you're telling about uh, how you uh, do a monetary policy by uh, no, uh, lowering the weight, but how can you be sure that's not the other way around? So if you have the fissure that do kind of stable in the data, so you have to no, I higher the weight to get more inflation. No, I, 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 well, I, 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 I don't think you should use interest rates as the way you conduct monetary policy, but that's the way central bankers are doing it, actually. I'm, I'm very skeptical about using the interest rates as the policy instruments. What central banks are doing, they are creating money, which is increasing the money base, how much base money is created. They can increase that or decrease that. I think that that's how you do it. If you were targeting a future, you would buy and sell that future, so you would actually create base money or not. M my view would be, Stop thinking about interest rates in terms of monetary policy. Interest rates are surprisingly little to do with monetary policy. That's all about credit markets, which is something completely different. Friedman could talk long about that. Very few people who talk about monetary policy realize that interest rates is not uh, a, a good measure of, of, of inflation, uh, or not of, of, of monetary policy. For example, uh, we need to keep it brief yeah. uh, because <laughs> we don't have that much. To, do you have a brief comment, Leo, or should we no, proceed? That's no, that's fine. Uh, right, all right. We have a next question here. Remember to state your name. Hi, my name is Yannick Jonsson. Um, I just, uh, what do you think about new currencies such as cryptocurrency? Uh, and this is a question for Leo. Okay, so bitcoins are yeah. your recent um, in innovation, or at least it attempts to be that. Um, well, first of all, bitcoins and the like have created a system of uh, clearing that is very thing and very capable and maybe will be something that can be used by the world. Um, certainly the futures markets are interested in doing that. We're, we're in the observation stage of it. 
whether bitcoins themselves will be the monetary unit um, and replace currency as a result, that's still an open question. Um, it has been used for illegal purposes, um, you know, laundering money and the like. And that it does not uh, bode very well for the idea because uh, uh, clearly that's not the purpose involved. So the best I can do is tell you we're going to watch and wait. And we're going we're gonna to be open to the idea. We're not close to it. We have a very good committee that is reporting, on, that is studying this, and we'll come back to, I chair what is known as the strategic um, committee of the CME. And when, once it comes to us with some recommendation, I will know more what to say than I can right now. You want to add? No, I think that is exactly my view. I think that there are, there are interesting perspectives on, on Bitcoin and other similar currencies. I think there's a tendency in free market and, and libertarian circles to be a little bit uh, caveman uh, about this. And, and you know, it tends to attract the same kind of crowd as, as, as Goldbox. But, but that being said, uh, free markets in money have historically existed. They can work. Whether Bitcoin is that free market, I, I'm quite very doubtful about actually, for all kinds of reasons. But 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 the general principle, it could and should work, and it should be allowed to work. That's the most important thing. Great, thank you. We have a question here from Tipas Martin Orup. Oh, great! I don't have to present myself. That's fantastic. <laughs> thank you very much for for two. Um, Fantastic presentations that fit it together like uh, cheese and wine. I don't know who's the cheese and who's the wine. Um, we will have wine. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> now, uh, a question for you, Leo. Um, what is your comment on the uh, search of uh, the the rapid uh, increase in the amount of uh, international and national regulation of financial markets uh, in 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 the response to the? financial crisis? Well, that, that's a great question. I thank you for, for asking that because that is uppermost in many of our minds. And um, I sweated out a Dodd-Frank regulatory authority that we now live under uh, in the U.S. And I knew both Chris Dodd and Bonnie Frank very, very well. And I opposed most of what they instituted because um, it isn't going to prevent the next crash. There isn't anything, I think, that can be done to prevent the next crash except to close the door on markets entirely. Now, if nothing moves and nobody trades and nobody's in business, I guarantee you there won't be a crash. There won't be a market and there won't be a business and there won't be a country. North Korea. <laughs> there you go. That's a good example. So. There isn't any magic bullet or anything like that. What they did do, some of it is okay, because they adopted the understanding that actually the marketplace is a good place to um, be safer. And so they said that what we did in futures was the right approach in guarding against failure of any one individual in this fashion. Uh, in on the date that Lehman Brothers went under, arguably the biggest disaster that we felt, Lehman Brothers was a uh, very big company, I knew very well, they went bankrupt in this meltdown. The day they went bankrupt, they had positions at our exchange, CME, in notional value, one trillion dollars. Open positions, open positions. And they were going bankrupt. And the next day, we auctioned off their positions to banks and future market participants that wanted that business. Why? Because everything was paid for. They didn't, it didn't cost anybody anything because our market works on a mark-to-the-market basis. The night before they went bankrupt, all their positions were paid for to the market. There was no debt because we work on a mark-to-market -market basis. Every day, twice a day, the CME collects on the basis of what the market is at that moment in time. From the longs, if they are wrong, from the shorts, if they are wrong, and is even. 
at that moment in time, we owe no debt. Nobody in our business owes any debt. Dodd Frank and Barney, I mean, Dodd and Barney, <laughs> Frank, we spent a great deal of time talking about that. That system of mark to the market is the best the human being can invent. So that they said, well, why don't we apply that to the over-the-counter market? Um, in fact, the over-the-counter market didn't have that. Going into 2008 and the meltdown, the mark-to-market -market was, I owe you. We, we made the deal that I will protect you. Yes, I will protect you. When things changed, I haven't paid you yet that protection. That will come later. Hey, you know, I, if you're still in business and you weren't in business, then it can't be protected. In the futures market, we say, no, no, no. Any change in value is paid for every day, all the time. And today, the Dodd-Frank rule has brought a great deal of over-the-counter markets into that model. Some of it has come to our exchange, so I applauded that part. But it also allowed others to create clearing entities that can do that. And that's the one part that Dodd-Frank got right. Uh, the, o the rest of it is a bit of overregulation that is nonsense. And the problem with it is, is that it isn't even uniform. So the Europeans don't want this, and the Americans don't want that. And now you, can, you go in a world of uh, regulatory arbitrage. Wherever it'll fit you better, that's the market you'll go to. And that's the worst way to do regulation. So basically, I would not give them very high grade, but they did do one thing very well. Great. Thank you. OK, so you're clearly both very knowledgeable and very passionate, passionate about the subject. But uh, all this knowledge and passion also means that we are down to our last questioner. If we have one, no. Oh, yes, of course. Please yeah. add your thoughts, Lars. And the disclaimer, I'm, I'm speaking on my own behalf. You work, I work for, a, for a fairly large bank in this country. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not talking on, on the bank's behalf. But I, I do think that we have had massive regulatory overkill, uh, both in, in, in Europe and in, in the US, in the sense that we have misdiagnosed a lot of the problems. Uh, and as a result, we are applying the wrong medicine. Uh, one of the things we have misdiagnosed is that we have not been able to differentiate between monetary issues and credit and bon banking issues. That's one thing. The other thing is that while there has surely been problems with moral hazard, that is when I'm paying my son's Lego to behave, uh, there is also been created new moral hazard issues. And, and so I, I'm not sure that we have a safer financial regulatory framework today than we had 10 years ago. Uh, neither in the US nor in, in Europe. And then I have one, one major concern is that if you look at the US or, uh, since, since the Great Depression, uh, there has been a, a, enormous growth in regulatory. There, re there, was a, in, in the, there was an enormous strong reaction, regulatory reaction to the Great, reaction, the Great Depression. As a result, the banking industry in the US became highly politicized. And that led to every time a politician came with new regulation, the, the banking industry reacted by coming up with ways of getting support. Okay, we'll follow your rules, but you should give us some support. Uh, and as a result of that, the US industry, much more so than the European and particularly than the Scandinavian, <coughs> has become, since the Great Depression, extremely politicized. And therefore, there becomes a close connection between the political system and the banking system and the monetary regime. And, and when you have chairmen of certain banks become ministers of finance of certain countries, and then the next day going out and becoming something in the financial sector, you might have problems with differentiating when you're deciding whether you are acting on your own behalf or your former employer's behalf. And I think that the problem is significant in the US, and it has become larger and not smaller. Uh, I'm not saying Dr. Frank in itself, but a number of the regulatory issues that have created that problem. I would like to end on a, a little bit a different um, path um, in this fashion. We live in the most interesting moment in time for 
everything because of the internet. Now here is what I mean. In, in the 20th century, um, the innovations were dramatic, as you know what happened in the 20th century. And it was because knowledge and information were available to people like all of you. And you could think of what you could do with that knowledge and information. But it was limited to several uh, developed countries, the United States being one of the most developed, perhaps. Today, all of that has expanded it to a, the highest degree possible. Everyone in the world, no matter where you are, where you live, have the opportunity to get that information through the internet. So what we've done is multiplied to everyone. We've democratized information to an extent that if we all went to sleep tonight and woke up 10 years from now, we wouldn't know what planet we're on. So much is about to change and continue changing. That's very, very bullish on the world. If the governments will let us, I think information will make even greater impact on all lives to the better and all standards of living to the better. So I ask that the government let the information market continue the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. A silent plea for <laughs> liberty. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to our two speakers, Leo Melamed, the global inventor of financial futures, and Lars Christensen, um, head of emerging markets at Danske Bank. Thank you very much for coming here to see